I would now like to invite Professor Richard Bissell to give an acceptance speech on behalf of the Honorands. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> Honoured guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be talking to you on behalf of my fellow Honorands. Congratulations to all the students on graduating and for everything you've achieved so far. You must be delighted that all your hard work has paid off. I too am delighted to receive my fellowship. I was beginning to wonder, after 35 years of descending into that wonderful concrete bunker that is Guildhall, just how much longer I would have to wait for it. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, after so many years, I've ended up teaching hundreds of students, many of whom have gone on to have successful musical careers. In all this time, however, there has been one question that nobody has ever seemed able to answer. Perhaps you can help me with it. Does anybody actually know how to get to B16? <laughs> Parents, you might understand that one. I must admit that I didn't study at Guildhall. Instead, I spent three years in that not quite as good music college on Marylebone Road. <laughs> in those days, the course lasted only three years, but I still couldn't wait to leave. I bet everybody knows that feeling. On leaving the academy, I got a job in the LSO, and because of the orchestra's connection with Guildhall, I somehow started teaching next door in 1983. I look back at those early days and now realise how I relied on a mixture of youthful naivety and blissful ignorance to not even doubt myself as to whether I was actually qualified to teach there. The students I was teaching were barely older than I was, yet I was expected to teach them everything I knew, which with hindsight was obviously not a lot. I suppose I must have done a lot of blagging and bluffing, which, as I'm sure you know, is an art in itself. As long as I stayed one page ahead of the student in the instruction manual, no one was the wiser. This brings me on to a significant point, that of self-belief. We as musicians or artists of any description spend an inordinate amount of time self-examining. Because of this and by the very nature of what we do, it is too easy to internalize our feelings and to be over self-critical. Of course, being honest with ourselves is a necessary process to go through to achieve performance excellence, and without it we would never improve. However, criticism shouldn't be seen as a wholly negative concept. It's a bit like making mistakes. It's a great idea to see them as a positive opportunity to learn and improve. Remember the old adage, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. However, time after time I've seen students not quite reaching their true potential because they fixate on their weaknesses and don't recognize and celebrate their strengths. One weak element that needs to be improved mustn't become the benchmark by which we rate ourselves in the eyes of others. Don't forget that all those seemingly flawless players who appear to just swan around effortlessly will have their own secret weaknesses too. They've just developed the knack neither to dwell on them nor to reveal them, but instead to focus on their strong points, which in turn powers their self-belief. It's important to recognize that with any career, you're in it for the long haul. So it's vital to demonstrate respect, understanding, support, humility, toleration, and friendship to arm yourself against whatever the music profession may throw at you, and it will. Don't be afraid to be yourself or show your personality don't be too proud, have a good sense of humour, don't take yourself or life too seriously. And remember to stay as musically inquisitive and as versatile as possible. After all, your prime concern is to make yourselves employable. <laughs> as I said, be respectful. When I joined the LSO when I was about your age, I saw quite a few older players probably not much older than me now, and I thought, ooh, they sound a bit ropey. Little did I appreciate that they had once been at the top of their game and playing like stars before I was even born. 
Now they were simply seeing out their careers after years of loyal service. Someone once summed up a musician's career from a fixer's perspective as an arc of five stages from beginning to end. I've always liked this, and it goes as follows. Number one. Who's Richard Bissell? Never heard of him. Number two. Hey, have you heard that Richard Bissell everyone's talking about? Three. I must have Richard Bissell. Four. If I can't get player X, Y, or Z, I suppose I could try Richard Bissell. <laughs> Five. Who's Richard Bissell? <laughs> Maybe that joke gets better as you get older, I don't know. <laughs> so, it's important to make your own luck. Nothing will happen without some input from you. When opportunities arise, make sure you grab them with both hands. If you don't, someone else will. Don't be afraid of those uncomfortable feelings you may get when trying out something new. Dealing with them can lead to some life-enhancing reciprocal collaborations with your fellow artists who can inspire you as you inspire them. If you don't push yourself, you'll never grow and you could be missing out on something amazing just around the corner. Take an interest in what others are doing and in all forms of music, not just classical. In my experience, classical musicians can be quite straight-jacketed, therefore depriving themselves of other forms of life-expanding music. Reassuringly, what we do is a great example of meritocracy. If you can't play your instrument to the required standard, no amount of nepotism or old boy connections will help you if you can't actually negotiate those solos during that intergalactic live broadcast when the camera is right up your nose. A meritocracy is a great leveller. As such, it is most gratifying to find myself from time to time sitting next to someone I taught only a few years previously. And we all get paid the same, well, just about. There are no long service bonuses for the older players. Boo! <laughs> this sense of being level and equal results in my experience, and I'm talking horn players here, in very few big egos. Throughout my career, I've had the privilege through music to travel all over the world stay in great hotels and experience different cultures, giving me a valuable opportunity to grow and learn in all respects. The only fly in the ointment on these trips has always been that we actually have to give concerts. <laughs> they all seem to get in the way of a good paid holiday. I could give you a long history of all the fun I've had on tour over the years, but that would take far too long and be far too tedious for you all. Plus, I don't want to get sued. So here are just a few of my stand-up memories. The London Philharmonic Orchestra has been resident at Glyndebourne for many years. One of the best productions I played in was Porgy and Bess. The dress rehearsal was open to friends and family of the cast, an extremely appreciative and partisan crowd. The atmosphere was electric, verging on the ecstatic, and in the pit, the excitement was palpable as we happily tackled the wonderful score with its many heartbreaking and uplifting melodies, sung with such style and insight by the cast. As I drove home afterwards, my friend and I, both high on Gershwin, sang non-stop at the top of our voices. Of course, that was in the good old days before speed cameras on the M25. <laughs> I got home in record time, I think it was about an hour and 40. That's the power of music for you. Some time ago, I got invited to record a horn quartet written by Paul McCartney. In fact, we recorded it twice. The first time down at his studio in Icklesham in East Sussex. He does serve a nice breakfast, by the way. Veggie sausages and everything. <laughs> the second time, with a slightly new improved version at Abbey Road, followed by a performance at the Abbott Hall. He even flew us out to New York to repeat the concert in the Carnegie Hall where during the rehearsal we experienced the most famous Paul on the planet taking photographs of us. Talk about role reversal. <laughs> Years later, back at Glyndebourne, when the LPO, with the LPO, we were approaching the end of Act One of Vorjak's Rusalka, when I became aware of a strange slow motion blur that passed across the corner of my left eye. Then the music 
gradually petered out until there was a stunned silence in the whole theatre. That in itself is weird. We're programmed to keep playing, even when the music seems to be falling apart, aren't we? So what had happened? The leading lady had got her foot caught in some netting on stage and had tumbled backwards into the pit. Her fall was broken by one of the cellists. She had crashed onto his left shoulder, snapped off the neck of his cello and ended up unconscious on the floor. Here I must make a confession. When it became clear what had actually happened, rather than my first thought being one of concern for the singer's welfare, my actual first thought was, I wonder if the show will be cancelled and we all get to go home early. <laughs> but in true showbiz tradition, an understudy was found, along with an understudy for the understudy, and we finished the show, after albeit slightly later than planned. The story made headlines worldwide and even appeared in the sun. <laughs> Probably the one and only time the word opera has been mentioned in that esteemed <laughs> newspaper. I know I've joked about the non-musical benefits of touring, but I'll finish, you'll be pleased to know, with what happened towards the end of an LPO tour around America in 1987. It had been a long and difficult tour for many reasons, and in all honesty, the relationship between the conductor, no names, and the orchestra had turned decidedly sour, and everyone couldn't wait to get home. Just before the end of the tour, when the orchestra had had enough, we were to travel from New York to Washington, D.C., the orchestra was to fly there and the instruments were to go by road. On the day in question, the weather had dumped a week's worth of snow overnight. We managed to fly to Washington, but the truck didn't show up in time for the rehearsal. Trying not to get our hopes up, we waited and waited until the concert was called off. We <laughs> Imagine that. After all the stress of the tour, the orchestra was elated. It was like the end of term and we'd been let out of school early. As you can imagine, we spent the unexpected evening off celebrating with a heightened sense of achievement and justification. There were some sore heads the next day, I can tell you. So there we have it, boys and girls, the joyful zenith of my musical career, a cancelled concert. <laughs> well, I've waffled on long enough so I'll finish once again by saying congratulations and I wish you a long, happy and fulfilling career. Thank you.